Didn't they do well? Thank you, Baba Kokola. Let's read from first, sorry, uh, Second Samuel chapter fifteen. Second Samuel chapter fifteen. To continue on the theme of praying and positioning. And after that, we'll go to the very last. Number five, entitled uh, Miracles. Second Samuel chapter 15, and reading from verse 32. Now, it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. There was Hushai the Archite coming to meet, meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Ab Absalom, I'll be your servant. O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant. Then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Remember where we've ended off before the break that when we pray, we also need to position ourselves to make our prayers easy to answer. You know, the Bible says we should love one another, but there are certain people who are easier to love. Others you have to try hard. Forgive me for the graphic way I preach, but that's the way my mind works. If, if, if somebody wants to befriend you, and they're talking very close to your face. And you can see all the saliva jumping up in their mouth and white stuff collecting here and there. Hard as, as hard as you may try, you may discover a cement mixer inside your tummy going up and down. Even though they're smiling, the more they smile, oh. The more you have a face like Mr. Beans, and you feel, oh dear. Don't they have a wife or a friend who could tell them if God has blessed you with more saliva than average? Why don't you have a handkerchief? So that when you talk, there's no harm if that's the way some people produce more but they need to manage it. That's all. And be aware when people are backing off, then they realize that there's something that quickly... I've noticed one lady preacher who came to our Bible college once had such a, a, a blessing from the Lord, and she had a very dainty uh, handkerchief with a lace edging, very nice. So as she was preaching, she was holding the handkerchief. And the Lord says, very nice. So when you want to love the brethren, some people make it easier. So we need to pray and to position. And here was David in a very critical point in his life. Fighting enemies was one thing. Fighting his own son was another. It was a no-win situation. If he lost, he would lose his throne. If he won, his son would lose his life. He was in a real dilemma. But Absalom the wayward. David 
had to remain on the throne because he had been anointed by the Lord to be there. So when Hushai came to join his camp as he was fleeing from Jerusalem, and there were two people who surrounded the king, Ahithophel and Hushai, both were men of knowledge and good counsel, wise men who gave counsel. So the Hushai came to say, I can't stay in Jerusalem when you are fleeing from your son. I'm going to join you. But because David had prayed that God will deliver him from this crisis, he also had to position himself by saying to Hushai, if you remain here with me, you'll only be a burden to me. If you really want to be useful, go back to Absalom. Pretend that you will now join his team so you can defeat for me the council of Ahithophel. And when Ahithophel gave a particular counsel and Hushai gave a contrary one, God backed him up that they followed Hushai. But if Hushai wasn't there, God couldn't back it up. This is, the more, this is the area I want you to please listen and listen carefully. Because sometimes there's a dichotomy in the church. Where the church is full of high flyers, people who work in the city, people who are lawyers, people who are accountants, people who are consultants, people who are using their wits and their brain and their expertise on a daily basis. And when they come into church, they just sit down and bury everything as if Sunday is different to Friday. So we have a lot of talent. And unfortunately, some of them are too expensive to employ. Like one American preacher said to God when he was a high flyer, a big earner, uh, like a half a million dollar salary earner, and he, he, he came to a meeting and they were preaching about winning souls for Christ and leaving your all to serve the Lord. And he came forward to say God spoken to him that he wants to work for the Lord. But they had to confess that God couldn't afford him because of his lifestyle, heavy mortgage, expensive private schools, the kind of uh, luxury of having um, staff to run his house, gardeners, many cars, and shopping spree by his wife who had been blessed with the ministry of spending I want to serve you, God, but you can't afford me. Well, in this day and age, you don't have to give up your income before you can work for the Lord. You can be a tent maker just like Paul the Apostle, who said, these hands have ministered to my needs.
Didn't they do well? Thank you, Baba Kokola. Let's read from first, sorry, uh, Second Samuel chapter fifteen. Second Samuel chapter fifteen. To continue on the theme of praying and positioning. And after that, we'll go to the very last. Number five, entitled uh, Miracles. Second Samuel chapter 15, and reading from verse 32. Now, it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. There was Hushai the Archite coming to meet, meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Ab Absalom, I'll be your servant. O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant. Then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Remember where we've ended off before the break that when we pray, we also need to position ourselves to make our prayers easy to answer. You know, the Bible says we should love one another, but there are certain people who are easier to love. Others you have to try hard. Forgive me for the graphic way I preach, but that's the way my mind works. If, if, if somebody wants to befriend you, and they're talking very close to your face. And you can see all the saliva jumping up in their mouth and white stuff collecting here and there. Hard as, as hard as you may try, you may discover a cement mixer inside your tummy going up and down, even though they're smiling. The more they smile, oh. The more you have a face like Mr. Beans, and you feel, oh dear. Don't they have a wife or a friend who could tell them if God has blessed you with more saliva than average? Why don't you have a handkerchief? So that when you talk, there's no harm if that's the way some people produce more but they need to manage it. That's all. And be aware when people are backing off, then they realize that there's something that quickly... I've noticed one lady preacher who came to our Bible college once had such a, a, a blessing from the Lord, and she had a very dainty uh, handkerchief with a lace edging, very nice. So as she was preaching, she was holding the handkerchief. And the Lord says, very nice. So when you want to love the brethren, some people make it easier. So we need to pray and to position. And here was David in a very critical point in his life. Fighting enemies was one thing. Fighting his own son was another. It was a no-win situation. If he lost, he would lose his throne. If he won, his son would lose his life. It was in a real dilemma. But Absalom the wayward. David 
had to remain on the throne because he had been anointed by the Lord to be there. So when Hushai came to join his camp as he was fleeing from Jerusalem, and there were two people who surrounded the king, Ahithophel and Hushai, both were men of knowledge and good counsel, wise men who gave counsel. So the Hushai came to say, I can't stay in Jerusalem when you are fleeing from your son. I'm going to join you. But because David had prayed that God will deliver him from this crisis, he also had to position himself by saying to Hushai, if you remain here with me, you'll only be a burden to me. If you really want to be useful, Go back to Absalom. Pretend that you will now join his team so you can defeat for me the counsel of Ahithophel. And when Ahithophel gave a particular counsel and Hushai gave a contrary one, God backed him up that they followed Hushai. But if Hushai wasn't there, God couldn't back it up. This is, the more, this is the area I want you to please listen and listen carefully. Because sometimes there's a dichotomy in the church. Where the church is full of high flyers, people who work in the city people who are lawyers, people who are accountants, people who are consultants, people who are using their wits and their brain and their expertise on a daily basis. And when they come into church, they just sit down and bury everything as if Sunday is different to Friday. So we have a lot of talent. And unfortunately, some of them are too expensive to employ. Like one American preacher said to God when he was a high flyer, a big earner, uh, like a half a million dollar salary earner, and he, he, he came to a meeting and they were preaching about winning souls for Christ and leaving your all to serve the Lord. And he came forward to say God spoken to him, that he wants to work for the Lord. But they had to confess that God couldn't afford him because of his lifestyle, heavy mortgage, expensive private schools, the kind of uh, luxury of having um, staff to run his house, gardeners, many cars, and shopping spree by his wife who had been blessed with the ministry of spending I want to serve you, God, but you can't afford me. Well, in this day and age, you don't have to give up your income before you can work for the Lord. You can be a tent maker just like Paul the Apostle, who said, these hands have ministered to my needs and to those who are working with me. The days of having an old, out-of-date overseer are over. This is a modern age where we have, the only thing old about us is our date of birth, not our thinking. God will renew our mind. Amen. We have to be up-to-date. We have to be current. We have to be, we have to be dynamic, changing with the times. So you don't come to church and say, well, I don't want to disturb the way they do things, but if this was a corporate meeting, this is the way we will plan. This is, we will do this. If we do that, we do that. We'd, no, 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 we don't want the, uh, all that, no. That's the old fashioned. Nowadays, whatever you've got, bring it. Because we're not ministering to people in grass skirts, at least not in London. We're ministering to people who are living in the real world and they don't want to come to a church and go back in time to people who are slow and sluggish and 
put their, put their brain into reverse when they come into church. I was unfortunate some years ago to be broke. And it's no joke when you are broke. Believe you me. It's no laughing matter. So I went to do um, insurance sales, to be an insurance salesman. And why was I broke? Not because um, God wasn't using me to be a blessing to people, but it was in that Area, uh, era where at least in England among English national churches or if, if, if this was Africa we would call them the, the natives the indigenous people who still live in England they call them English people very 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 stingy you remember the half a crown I told you about? Right, well, that's even very good if they give you half a crown. You, I used to go to some churches and they would say, do you have any expenses? Uh, no, a donkey brought me. <laughs> you say, I've traveled about two hours to get here. You say, do I have any expenses? If you don't want to give me money, say you don't want to give me money. <laughs> of course, I only say that inside. <laughs> Outside, I think, <laughs> no. <laughs> so I went to work for an insurance company, Hambro Life, which was taken over by, I think, Abbey Life, which later became Zurich. And, and because I was a preacher, I knew how to communicate. So I became one of the best salesmen, and my wife and I won a trip to Miami for one of the rewards for best salesman. I sold more, I sold more policies than many who are very, very much advanced, and I was black in an all-white town. But I just stand there. Hello. Give them time to get used to me. <laughs> and one man told me, he says, I, I'm going to buy from you because I've never met an intelligent black person before. <laughs> face to face, they may be, but he'd never met them because there weren't many where he lived. I'm going to buy from you. You interest me. You're a good communicator. Sign. And when somebody signed, then I will get referral. Give me 10 or 15 people, people who you like and people who you are related to, and I'll phone them up. Hello, so and so, I just brought some, bought something from me that he thinks you need to know about. Yeah. <laughs> is it Tuesday or Wednesday? Two o'clock or five o'clock? Which one is convenient? The only answer is yes. <laughs> you can only say yes Tuesday or yes Friday. I'm coming. And so on. So I, 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 I must agree I was good. And so. I mean, I, I bought, with the money I bought, um, um, uh, a BMW, uh, um, is it five series? Six, six. Anyway, the big one with the two exhaust. Seven series, yes. Two exhaust. And I had sunglasses even when it was dark. <laughs> so there's nothing you have done that I haven't tried. <laughs> but one of the salesmen in, in, I was in York, there was another one in Leeds, another salesman in the Leeds team and we used to meet for a, a regional conference so that they can make you compete against each other and get more awards the more awards you get the more policies they sell obviously 
And I met this man, and we tried to mentor each other. And this man was trying to mentor me, to try and tell me how he became one of the few called round, uh, one million dollar round table salesman. Somebody who could write uh, a cover for up to a million, do a million dollar worth of business in a year. And we're talking of 1980. So I met him and I admired him, but I couldn't emulate him because it was way above my level. And what he did was to create an impression of success. He was no better a salesman than me, but he had a better um, image. First, I had a Ford um, I know it was not Cortina, but it was something <laughs> slightly better. Anyway, it was Ford. He had a Mercedes S-Class. And we were doing the same thing. Not only that, he had a lady chauffeur with white gloves that works like this. And then his secretary, the secretary will make a call and say, Mr. So-and-so has something to share with you, sir. When are you free? I'm making a call on behalf of so-and-so and so. When he arrives at your door, it could be a council estate, it could be the executive of a big company, it will be the chauffeur, the lady, who will knock. And when you open, she will say, my boss is here. Are you ready to receive him? And by the time now she goes and opens his car door, you feel like, wow. If this is a salesman, he's coming to do me good. Not knowing he's coming to take your money. And the impression was, if he wasn't good, he wouldn't be able to afford this lifestyle. And that was his image. Now, you come with your portfolio and your shoes that have certain level uh, angle at the heels, and you knock. Yes. I went to one door, I said, I've got a policy for you that it, when you die, your wife will be rich. <laughs> the bloke says, when I die, she can marry again. <laughs> Up it. You mean when I die, she'll be rich to marry somebody again and then he will be enjoying my money? No, thank you. So he just slammed the door. And that's the point. Many of us have good brains, good expertise, good experience, but we don't use it in church because we think there's a tradition that says we have to do certain things in an old-fashioned way according to some old people who don't think anymore. You are in the wrong church for that. We are forward-looking. You can do anything that is holy and perfect but up to date. We want to come to your church. We want to come to your church and feel, yes, I would like to stay here. I love the way everything is done decently and properly. Don't you feel embarrassed when you're looking at the television news and the auto cue is uh, not working? Don't you feel embarrassed for the news reader because they say, uh, 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 for a brief second, they don't know what next to say. It's because we're so used to them being sleek and streamlined and professional. That's why we feel embarrassed because we're not used to it. Because we can turn them off and go to another station. You must be like that. 
you must be your best. Then if you be your best, you'll get people who are going places. And it's people who are going places who are good leadership material. On one of my visits to Nigeria, one brother came to me and says, our church is becoming like any other. I said, what's wrong? He says, there's discrimination in some of our churches. You don't know what is going on. I said, you tell me what is going on, because I don't know. I only know good things that are going on. You tell me bad news. What is going on? He says, discrimination against ordinary people like me. Any time the pastors want to make people leaders, they always choose people with nice cars, big houses, fat salary, and executives. Put them in leadership. What's wrong with the rest of us? That's discrimination. I said, it isn't. If somebody can run a company, he's able to run the church. But if all you do is to carry fires from office to office, and then on Sunday you think you'll be an executive material? Ah, I said, it's the same thing. They have been trained for free by their company to know how to think corporate, to know how to manage people, to know how to manage time, to know how to face challenges without crumbling. That, that's the way. Why do you think Paul the Apostle could write 14 epistles and some only wrote one? Because Paul was a logician. He studied under Gamaliel. Not only did Paul learn the Bible, not only did Paul learn theology, but Paul was also a student of logic. He was a logician. He learned the art of oratory. That's why he said to the Athenians who like to discuss and to debate, he says, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But if it's your level, I could do it. But I put it to one side. I don't want to go on the cerebral level, but I can handle it. Even one of your poets says, you Christians, you are this. You Athenians, you are that. You say there's a God to the unknown. He was able to quote their poets. He was able to quote their literature. He was able to quote relevant uh, examples from the, 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 the world um, of gladi gladiators, people wrestling with beasts. He didn't, mix up with, he, he, he didn't mix up his geography and say Australia is in Austria. <laughs> Just because you're doing God's work doesn't mean it has to be shoddy. Just because you are doing God's work doesn't mean you, have, you don't have to know everything to help you be the best you can be. Paul, when Paul preached to Agrippa and he reasoned with him, that is logic. He reasoned with him about righteousness and judgment. And the man says, Paul, you are mad. Much learning has made your head off. If a, a, a non-Christian can say to Paul, much learning. He recognized that Paul was a very brilliant mind. Even our beloved brother Peter says some of the things our brother Paul says, very difficult. Oh. <laughs> what it meant was for a fisherman, very difficult to understand. He didn't say it was not revelation, but the way he put it, Peter had not been schooled in the... In the in, in the level of logic. When he preached, he says, you vipers, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That is logic. You reason it. Use your brain. The way I've explained your situation, 
and the requirements of God. You, does it appear reasonable to you that you can escape? Remember, the Holy Spirit doesn't just speak to our hearts. He speaks to our mind, and our mind communicates with our hearts. That's why we're a religion of the Bible. If we're not a religion of the book, we will just sit here and say, home, 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 and be meditating and be swinging incense. The pulpit is central because we are trying to approach the mind. And many of you are well trained. So don't waste it. Whatever, whatever you can bring into the ministry, bring it. If you are wrong, we'll tell you. If we don't tell you, it means you are right. Understand? Wait until we say, oh, the way you're doing it is too ultra modern. Wait. I've yet to tell anybody that yet. But people are afraid. Same people. The way they do things in church is completely opposite to the way they will do it when Pam Sterling is on the line. You go to a corporate meeting and they ask you to present your proposal. And then, well, I can. Um, <laughs> Oh, by the way, what shall we talk about today? Eh? You won't need Alan Sugar to say you're fired. Even you will fire yourself. Right. Let's close the meeting. By going to 1 Corinthians and... Chapter 14. Are you blessed? Yes. Are you enlightened? Yes. Are you happy you came? Yes. Will you pray for me like they do in Nigeria? May you live long for us. Yes. Or you won't ever die unless you want to. By the way, living has nothing to do with longevity. That's why the Bible says Abraham was old and full of years. You can be old and useless. Or you can be old and your years are not wasted. Full. So living is not the main thing. Is bearing fruit in your old age. And old age is better than young age because you have experience. One. Two, you have courage. You can say things that others can't say. Like Bawa used to say to me, it's only in the mouth of the old that cola nut can mature. So there are certain things that I will say, some will find instructive. A younger person said, you may find it offensive. But that's what we're here for. I'm glad to be, to be a servant of the Lord. I'm very, very happy. I'm a very happy man. And what's making me happy is that I'm not afraid to die. Knowing that whatever God has told me, I've tried my best to follow. So that I would not be ashamed either at his coming or at my going. You come to a point where dying is more important than living because life really begins after death. And I don't want to be big on earth and small in heaven. Where are we? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. 
let all things be done for edification. Then go back to Mark 16 and verse 17. Mark 16 and verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. If possible, from time to time, whenever it's practical, let's make the church more user-friendly rather than a lecture theater where everybody sits and one person talks. There comes a time when people should be given the opportunity to use their gifts. I'm a firm believer in God's economy of share when it comes to sharing his gifts. If all the gifts and all the anointings were to remain on one person, that person will be in serious trouble. That's why Paul the Apostle said, on account of the great revelations given to me, God had to give me a thorn in the flesh just to keep him human, to keep him humble. So anointing and spiritual gifts are not good for one person. It's body ministry. It's for God to be able to use people in the pew. And I've had to correct one or two who says it's only an ordinary member. Who is an ordinary member? Is it written on his head? It's only ordinary? It's either everybody's ordinary or everybody's special. So the Bible says when you come together, each one has something to offer. This is the area I want to go to now, area of ministry. The Bible says one of you shall chase a thousand and two of you shall put 10,000 to flight. But it isn't two of you side by side. It's two of you together that will make it multiply by 10. So there are situations where a person has a problem and they come out for prayer. And the prayer of one person cannot be effective enough to solve that problem. You know the, um, the inner working of God answering prayer is revealed to us. Oh, I just remember something. I'm old. I'm aching. Everybody in my aching, everybody in my aching is hurting. I'm aching. I'm worn out. <laughs> oh, I suddenly remember. I'm, I'm aching. Hey. Hmm. I'm tired. God give me strength. Amen. So, the, oh yes, I'm telling you this so that you will have mercy on me. When I get home, it's Sister Kate who will begin her ministry. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll be worn out. I'll sit on the chair, and before I know it, it's when I wake up, I realize I've gone to sleep. <laughs> but the Spirit is willing. Now then, <clears throat> anointing is great. When the anointing is on you, you, you feel young. But when you finish and the thing goes, <laughs> you feel like somebody has been beating you with a hammer all over your shoulders. Anyway, that's my problem. Nothing to do with you. But you, one day you will be like me. I'm telling you in advance. Um, yes, the inner working of any time God answers prayer is given to us, an insight is given to us in the dream 
of Jacob when he was in Bethel. When Jacob went to Bethel and he slept. And he saw a ladder. Can you remember the ladder was from where? What? The, yes, the ladder was from earth to heaven and the angels were ascending and descending. Go and read it again. You'll find the ladder didn't come from heaven and the angels didn't descend from heaven. The angels were with him already because you have basically three types of angels. You have the seraphim and the cherubim. Those are the only angels who have wings. Two, to cover their faces so they won't look into God's face. Two, to cover their nakedness, their feet, and two, to fly. Those are there constantly worshiping God. Those are the archangels who join us when we worship God. That's what makes the anointing great when you are worshiping. When you are having spiritual warfare, you'll have angels. When you are having spiritual worship, you'll have archangels. Because they are there only to glorify God and say, holy, holy, holy. You have the worship angels. Then you have the warrior angels. An angel came to the camp of the Assyrians when they were trying to attack Hezekiah and and Jerusalem. And he went into the camp of the Assyrians. And by the time people woke up in the morning, 185,000 of them had died. Just one angel. That's a warrior angel. But by and large, most of us have messenger angels. These are what the book of Hebrews describes as ministering spirits. They minister to you. Uh, The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamp around those who fear him and delivereth them. So when we pray, these angels will now send a ladder to heaven and they will begin to climb the ladder and they will now get the answer from heaven and bring the answer back to you. That's the ascending and descending. They'll take the message to heaven, they'll bring the answer back from heaven. Sometimes they don't come back immediately and if you have moved from where the ladder was ascending, you may find that the parcel will be delivered at a different address. That's why you shouldn't let your confession contradict your prayer just because of delay. Anything you don't want, don't say it. Only say what you want. The woman who lost her child went to Elisha. Before she went to Elisha, she went to her husband, saddled me an ass, and gave me a servant. What's wrong? All is well. A lot of people make a mistake by acknowledging they have a problem. Once you acknowledge you have a problem because you're looking for sympathy, there's no anointing that can contradict the confession of your mouth. So how many of you here are poor? And I'm going to pray for you to be rich. There's no anointing on my hand that will convert what you've said by coming out, that I'm a poor person coming out. But if I am a good preacher, I wouldn't put that trap. I would say, how many of you want to be rich? How many of you want to be better? Always go for what you want, not what you're trying to escape from. Thou art snared by the words of your mouth and taken captive. By, the, by your confession. So, when we have somebody who has a problem and they come forward for prayer, 
The reason many, many of our prayers are not answered is because we depend on one person. And that person's faith may not be able to handle everything that comes across them. Simply because of our eyes. If we see less, we believe more. It's always easier to believe for what you don't see than for what you see. This is why many men have faith. More faith than women when it comes to domestic um, financial management. A man will say, don't worry, God will provide. All these children, they're his children. It's only the wife who knows that there's no money. The husband says, leave it to God. And the wife says, leave it to God, will not feed them. Where would we find money? Because she's looking at it. Now, a problem comes and you need to pray. My way of looking at it is when one person prays, the, the angel gets one foot on the rung of the ladder. Because the angels are not moved by your prayer. Prayer is only a vehicle for faith. If your praying is only full of pleading, it will not get to heaven. It's only when your prayer is full of faith and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As the faith increases, so you empower the angels to climb. However, just like yawning is contagious, so faith is contagious. Now, for some of you who are preachers here, I'm sure you've experienced the, the feeling that when somebody is preaching, you can get four or five messages from their preaching. More than they themselves can think of. You'd be jotting it down. And that's why some people, when I finish preaching, they say, may you live long for us. At least I've got five Sundays to take care of. <laughs> Ideas will promote other angles in your own mind. It's the same thing when we pray. When somebody prays, by the time the next person prays, they will go higher from where that person left off and pray something else. And that's why if five or six people are surrounding a particular individual, it's of no use five praying at the same time. It's one person praying and four listening so that the next person will go from a higher level. By the time the last person prays, the angel will reach heaven. It happened in one of my meetings when I had preached. And I learned this over a long time period. That when you want to have a success, the more people you have to help you in ministry, the more success you will have. So I called some people out. In fact, I forced a lot of people out who didn't want to come out. It's amazing when you want to do something for the Lord. That's when some people don't feel led. I don't know whenever they feel lead. Never feel lead. Feel copper. Feel like zinc. But just come. <laughs> so I forced them, come. So all the people who are in need, stay there. And I didn't go to any group so that my group would not be bigger. Surround them with five or six people. And there was one boy in one of the groups who was surrounding a man who was blind. Brothers, sisters, when somebody is blind, they can't see. So you can't tell them you are healed. And they say, yeah, amen, I believe. No, if they can't see, they can't see. And that's why I specialize in colds and flus, because I can guarantee if God doesn't heal them, in three days, it'll go. <laughs> Uh, we taught our children when they were small to pray for the morning. Pray for you when you're not well. Daddy, when you wake up, you'll be healed. I didn't tell them, 
you can do it now. I can be healed now. But they, so when, when, when they come to you in the morning, they bust into your bedroom. Daddy, 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 you are healed, you are healed. Because we played, prayed last night. Even if you are not healed, you'll get up to, in, to encourage them. <laughs> and believe you me, when you do get up to impress them, you get better. It's amazing what faith does. Faith is action. So there was one of these brothers. And if, if there is a crook, a, a, a born again crook, that one was number one. A, a fraud on his way to heaven, but a fraud. But he was there. He, he couldn't. Those are, the days, those are the days when I was willing to accept anybody who said uh, God called them. So I accepted from another ministry. But it was a fraud. He will sell you things he didn't have. It's when he's got your money, then he'll be looking around to buy it from somebody else. Anyway, fraud. He's still a fraud today. He's been deported now because he used somebody else's passport. Anyway, so when I see him, I can still tell him you're a fraud. And he hasn't paid. After 20 years I've known you, you're still a fraud. Why don't you change? But he was there. Surrounded. Surrounding. This blind man. The first person prayed because I taught them. The second person listened and prayed. And his faith went higher. The third person prayed. And his faith went higher. And the fourth person prayed. And his faith went higher. When it came to this, our fraud, born again worker, he opened his eyes. Because he was one of the area boys. And he looked, he looked at the... Um, blind man and he says open your eyes Joe <laughs> just like open your eyes in Jesus name and the man opened his eyes no integrity but he climbed on the shoulder of other people's faith and it was his faith that got the angel into heaven. So you never know because the Bible says God will distribute his gifts severally as he wills. God will distribute the gifts so that the body can flow together. One person will not say I'm the only superstar. You come to church, be, be ready to be useful. Because God can come upon you. This is team ministry. Where the body can minister to itself. Choir. Do we have a song called It's All About You? Jesus? Do you know it? Shall we rise up to pray? This is all about you. Okay, thank you. Now you know it. We'll pray first. Dear Holy Spirit, we thank you for this weekend. We pray it will be a weekend that will turn into a new chapter in our lives. We love you very, very much appreciate what you try to do in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus and thank you for using even broken and worn out vessels I pray something of what I have said over these couple of days can be used by you to be of eternal value that Jesus may be glorified Amen. and we ourselves may make him king Amen. in our lives 
that you will do certain things in our lives that will not make unbelievers stumble. Because they will see that yes, our faith is not in vain. That we are serving a living God. And we are a living proof that God is faithful. So bless your word to us. Make us the head and not the tail. Make us people who are self-motivated and divinely inspired. So that we can take this nation for you. Amen. Every nook and corner can be reached with your word and churches established. Amen. And every person you've allowed to come into this country. English, Scots, Irish, Welsh, Polish, Hungarians, Yugoslavia, French, Germans. Spanish, Portuguese, Americans, Afghanistans, Iranians, Iraqis, people who are staunch Muslims or out and out Hindus in their countries. You are bringing them here for economic or political reasons and we are here with the good news. Help us to be among those you can trust to reach every nation Amen. that with, is within this cosmopolitan, not only cosmopolitan city, but cosmopolitan country. Thank you for the generosity of Britain to allow refugees to come, to allow asylum seekers to come, to allow even those they know have contrary traditions to themselves and may even pose a threat to the security of the nation yet they have open arms free medicine free education for their children give them accommodation only for them to start plotting to destroy the fabric of the society Lord help us not to be uh, a nation within a nation not to form another subculture but to be versatile enough that we can reach people of every nation in this land with the gospel by pulling together. Thank you that you have started with us. Make us more, more diversified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.